Good morning, toasty morning. I hope all of you are comfortable either in, uh, in church or at home. Um, welcome to First Memorial either way. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Our opening song is Jesus Messiah. Give thanks to the Lord with your whole heart. On the day I called, you answered me. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let us give God our thanks and praise. Let us confess our sins, for God has already provided the means for our forgiveness and is calling us to return to him. Gracious God, have mercy on us. 
For we have failed to be faithful to you, while you have remained faithful to us. You show us your wisdom, but we prefer to go our own way. Our broken relationships with you and one another have created poverty in us and in our neighbors. In your mercy, reconcile us to you and each other for the work of justice, peace, and love through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Sisters and brothers, do not lose heart. When we call, God hears us. When we confess, God forgives us. We believe, and so we proclaim, in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. And the Holy Spirit, amen. And now here a summary of the law. On the night of his arrest in the intimacy of the upper room, Jesus told his disciples, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Today, as we look for words to give shape and substance to what we believe, let us remember the simple words of the Apostles' Creed, first taught to new believers generations ago, probably in the fifth century. We know those words very well, but please say them in your head and your heart. I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you all. Remembering that, remember also that Jesus has filled us with the Spirit, which enables us to live lives that show forth fruit as evidence of God's love for the world. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And now, please pray silently with me as I say, God of days, we praise your name, for your grace sustains us. We wait for you, Lord, for your word strengthens us. Our outer nature is wasting away day by day but our inner nature is being renewed by your daily bread. Grant us the eyes to see what cannot be seen and to gaze on what is eternal. May we revel in your work and be a visible witness of your invisible kingdom. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen.
Okay. Good morning, kiddos. It's me today, not Miss Karen. So, real quick, we are going to have our children's time. Now, many of you know, that know me know that I am a huge New England Patriots fan. What? Huge. I know. What? It's crazy, right? So, what if I showed up somewhere wearing this? If you don't know what this is, it is a Giants jersey. A little backstory: the Giants have beaten the Patriots twice in the Super Bowl, once to end their perfect season and another time just to break my heart a little bit more. Oh. So, I know, it was a sad day. Um, the Patriots fans have a very strong dislike for the Giants fan. So, imagine I show up wearing this. And all of a sudden, all of the Patriot stuff in my cubicle is taken down and gotten rid of all of my Patriots gear. People may start to ask me if something's wrong, if I'm okay, maybe I've gone crazy. They may be a little bit worried. Well, today's scripture lesson, we're going to learn about a time that Jesus' family and friends, they got a little concerned about him. Uh, Jesus, when he started his ministry, he started walking around, going place to place, and healing all these different people. And then he started getting a crowd, and people started following him. So he was at one house healing people, and somebody came up to him and told him, um, Jesus, your mother and your brothers and your sister are outside. They'd like to talk to you. And they're worried about you because they didn't really understand his mission from God. And Jesus replied, here are my brothers and my mother. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. So you guys out there think maybe, you know, your brother or your sister are just the ones that are related to you by blood. Well, Jesus says that anybody that believes in God and spreads God's will is family. So everybody here in church, everybody at home, everybody that may go to a different church that believes in God, we're all brothers and sisters. So let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for sending Jesus to tell us that as long as we believe in you, we are family, even if we're crazy and we root for the giants. Amen. Okay. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Holy God, let your spirit now move in us to turn us away from the temporary and move us to your eternal love, made visible in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Today's scripture lesson is taken from the gospel according to Mark, chapter 3, verses 20 through 35. Hear what the spirit is saying to the church. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he called, to them, he called them to him, and he spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man, then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, Put whoever out, out whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of eternal sin. For they, they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Megan. If you heard the children's message today, you heard the sermon. However, you're not getting off that easy. That's why I'm paid the big bucks. Not one of you is smiling. <laughs> Am I speaking? Is the volume up? Okay, but there is one more thing. I'm looking to specifically, but not exclusively, at Mark chapter 3, verse 29, where, Je- where Jesus said, But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Whoever blasphemes the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness. Among the qualities about God we especially like are his incomparable love and his indefatigable forgiveness. Like in Psalm 103, verse 12, which says, As far as the east is from the west, so far and farther are your sins removed from you. As far as the east is from the west, it's as far as you can go on earth. All that means that God completely removes our failures. He does not hold sin against us, nor does he want others to hold sin against us. God's ability to remove our faults from us is the reason salvation is possible for believers. As far as the east is from the west. But there is this one thing. What do we do with Mark 3.29? In light of the quality that we know and find reinforced countless times throughout scripture. God's incomparable intense love for us and is indefatigable not to be worn out forgiveness well we carefully consider the context the setting the people the time the language and the words that are spoken all together with who is there and what baggage or belief they bring with them. That makes up the context. Jesus in this story is confronted with two small groups. Two small groups of people while holding forth with a large crowd. We might say huge crowd. A crowd of fans, a crowd of followers, a crowd of people who are glad to see him, thrilled with what he has to say, and eager to obey him for the most part. One group, his mother and sisters and brothers, whom we can only assume are trying to protect him, trying to remove him from being able to attract dangerous attention from further proclamation of his popular teachings, except for the religious leaders. The second group includes the religious leaders, known as teachers of the law from Jerusalem. And they are irate. They don't like anything Jesus has to say. They don't like anything that makes the crowd hungry to hear more from him. They don't want to hear anything that leaves them out of being part of the ones who decide and who teach the truths about God. 
They are a dangerous group. Too much attention is not a good thing when you have jealous people around you. Jesus' family presents themselves at the door to a house in which he and his disciples were trying to eat. I say trying because there were, the house was surrounded with a humongous crowd. And they kept talking to him and asking him questions through the windows. It didn't help them eat, much less digest their food. It preoccupied them. It distracted them. It took away the time they needed to rest and recover for the next section or period of teaching in his plan for the day. His family tries to call him out. Most translations use the phrase, take charge of him. His family tries to take charge of him. A more literal translation of Mark says his family tried to seize him forcibly. Forcibly, not with fists or with hands or arms of strength, but with argument and with the influence of family, which was very important in this culture. In fact, if he was bringing trouble upon himself, he was bringing trouble on his family. That may be a strong factor in why they were anxious to muzzle him. Trying to rescue him is the best spin I can put on that. But when informed his biological family was outside and wanted him to go outside and be with them, saying things like, he's out of his mind. Don't listen to him. Tell him to come out here and talk to us. Jesus redefines his family for us. Not to slight those who he is connected to biologically. He redefines his family as those who support him, which his biological family was not doing. He redefines his family as those who follow his teachings, who welcome what he has to say who celebrate the miracles he presented to them as evidence that God is being revealed in him. And so he says, who is my family? The faithful followers here are my mother and sisters and brothers. But the second group, the teachers of the law, from Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was a hike. That was a long walk for them. They didn't do that in an afternoon or an evening. So the implication here is that they were really intent on putting a stop to this, that they would go to that length, to travel that distance, to find something that they could discredit him with. So... Instead of saying he was out of his mind, like the family said, they said he's possessed by Beelzebub. Another way, he's possessed by Satan. And the simplest way of saying it was they were saying he is possessed by the devil. And his teachings and his miracles are of Satan, not of God. His miracles and his teachings are of Satan, not of God. There is the blasphemy. There is the cause of our memory verse for this morning. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness. It's unforgivable, it's inconceivable. It's obscene. There isn't enough ivory soap in the world to wash out your mouths for uttering such blasphemy. Now, to my understanding, generations of Bible teachers have taught that this is an unforgivable sin. 
In fact, it's been labeled that. It is taught that way still today in many places. But when we consider the context, when we consider the two groups that were trying to stop him, when we consider, in contrast, that great crowd who were practically salivating to hear his next word because they were eager to hear the truth as they understood it. When we consider that context, I'm not so sure it is an unforgivable sin in the sense that God can do anything. You know the old smart aleck kid in Sunday school that all Sunday school teachers dread having to deal with in their own classroom. If God can do anything, can he make a rock so big he can't lift it? Anybody remember that? So the kids at First Memorial were better behaved. <laughs> yeah, right. If you buy that, I'd like to talk to you about some dry land in the middle of a swamp in Florida. I'm not so sure we really can call it an unforgivable sin. But in the moment in which the challenge was made by the teachers of the law, it was unforgivable. And I'm not the only student of scripture that comes to that conclusion. I can't say that to you with great certainty, but I can tell you this. I don't want to find out it is unforgivable in a personal way. I don't want that finger pointing at me saying, you'll never get in. And even if you did, you're going to get out for good behavior. But I really don't think there's any danger of that for me or for you. Because I find it impossible to conclude that any work that God is real, I'm sorry, that any work of God is really the work of Satan. Remember Jesus said, how can Satan call Satan out of someone? And the people who were sick, the people who were possessed, the people who were lame and crippled and deaf and dumb and blind were all considered to be possessed by Satan. It's why they were ostracized from their families and ostracized from their communities. How can a healing of people from those not only difficult to live with issues, but with that constant presentation of what was believed to be evidence of the presence of Satan in them, how could Satan be used to call Satan out of those who were presumed to be possessed? So Jesus' miracles could not have been of Satan. Remember, Satan's work always benefits Satan. Satan's intervention in individual histories of people and groups of people is always to get more people on his side and away from God's side. Why would Satan do that? Everything Satan does, then and now and long into the future, Everything Satan does is for his benefit. Where everything God does is for our benefit. It's so that we can live a full life, so that we can live a healthy life, so we can live a forgiven life, so we can live a loved life. A life that only elicits welcome and affection and forgiveness. There is this one thing. 
this context where Jesus is saying it's unforgivable. How could anybody say that? I think we may have misinterpreted that. But stretching the possibilities of us walking the edge to the nth degree, we don't want to be in that situation. So we will not claim that the healing of a blind man or a lame person or a sick person or rise, raising someone from the dead because of Jesus' words or his hand is evidence of Satan at work. It just can't possibly be. That has to be evidence of God at work. Amen and amen. It is with all sincerity that I say to you, as I have for many weeks now, we are grateful to have you with us as we worship on the second Sunday of Pentecost in whatever means you are able to be with us today. And we hope that you can be stewardship partners with us in our ministry as you have been partners with us in our worship. If you are able, please consider mailing an offering 
Send it to our church office, 51 West Blackwell Street here in Dover. And I promise you that money will continue this ministry in its many forms locally and around the world. Let us pray. Eternal God, your son Jesus teaches us that a house divided cannot stand. Together we offer ourselves and our gifts that they may be used to extend your grace to others for your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Whether you are here or at home or elsewhere, I remind you that communion celebrated here at this table is open to all who believe, regardless of church membership. It is our sacred privilege to gather around this table. After all, it is our sacred privilege to receive from ritual and from memory this sacrament of God's grace. Fathers and mothers, sisters and brothers, this is the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is here that we see the symbols of his sacrifice for the forgiveness of our transgressions and offenses against the Father. It is here that we taste and remember the flavor of our Lord's love in its many forms. Our Savior invites all who ever loved him to meet him here and renew their vows of commitment to the one who is most committed to us. Great God of blessing upon blessing, in every age since Abraham, your prophets have called your children back from their ways to follow your ways, teaching us to live by your holy word and to show forth your love and mercy to all. At the appointed time in history, you sacrificed your son on our behalf so that the altars of this world could forever grow cold from their vain temporary atonements and be replaced with tables of holy fellowship and communion and be cherished for eternity. Today we answer your invitation to come to such a table, be it in a sanctuary or a living room. And we ask that the bread and the cup we will consume from it may be transformed beyond their physical properties, that we might realize them as spiritual nourishment, which we need for living the redeemed life. Make our hearts ready to receive you in spirit and in truth. Amen. We all can recall that on the night of his arrest, Jesus was at table with his disciples in the upper room celebrating the Passover feast. And he took the symbolic bread in the course of the meal and gave thanks to God for it and shared it with his friends there as he shares it with us today with words that were meant to say, from now on, when you eat this bread from this ritual of God's saving grace, think of it as my body given for you and consume it again, remembering me. In the same way, he took the third cup of the ritual, the cup that followed the meal, the cup after supper. Again, he gave thanks for it and again he shared it with his friends, this time with words to the effect, from now on, whenever you drink this cup, remember that this cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you eat this bread or drink this cup, you celebrate the Lord's death until he comes again. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Whether here or at home, please consume your elements at this time. Does anybody need them from an usher? Doesn't already have them?
If you're not familiar, turn it over, tear the bottom off, remove the bread, consume it, then turn it upright, tear the top off, and have a sip of that not wine. By the memory stirred awake in us, by the sharing of this bread of heaven, and by drinking the cup of this salvation, our hearts are filled once again to overflowing with wonder as we contemplate your love, O oh God. As our happy songs and shouts of joy continue to ring out, we pray that you will speak through our words and deeds to this aching world for the cause of Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, joys and concerns. Um, today, June 6th, is National Cancer Survivors Day. And um, whenever I hear about this, it makes me think of, um, on ESPN every year they have what they call the ESPY Awards, which are awards that they give out to different athletes and stuff, but they always give out what they call the Jimmy Valvano Perseverance Award. And it goes out to somebody that has been struggling and you know has persevered. So back in 2014, it went to Stuart Scott, who was an ESPN anchor who was currently battling cancer when he was given the award. Um, in his acceptance speech, he said, when you die, that does not mean you lose to cancer. You beat cancer by how you live, why you live, and the manner in which you live. So live, live, fight like hell, and when you get too tired to fight, then lay down and rest and let somebody else fight for you. Um, I just encourage anybody out there to listen to his speech. If You can find it on Google, YouTube, all that. It is very inspiring speech. Unfortunately, he did pass away a couple months later, but he did fight like hell. So um, today we're going to celebrate all the survivors and pray for all of those currently fighting against cancer. And hopefully someday cancer will be a thing of the past and nobody will have to fight anymore. Um, our birthdays that we want to celebrate this week are for Hunter Casco, Griffin Burbridge, and Haley Mann. And the individuals that we want to pray for this week are Ayana, Angel, Dawn, Danielle, Lily, Bruce, Jody, Gina, Donna, Tony, Walter, Wayne, Diana, David, Eni, Israel, Jonathan, Karen, Kim, Keith, Larry, Nushabi, Joe, Nancy, Kyle, Barbara, Andrew, Jay, Jerry, Florence, Nancy, Ellen, Richard, Christine, Eddie, Armando, Sarah, Dominic, Denise, Shayla, Joanne, Peter, Kathy, Ted, Mario, Rich, Gary, Helen, Catherine, Amanda, Helen, Nancy, Althea, and Naomi. Megan, I believe you forgot somebody's birthday this week. It's Megan's birthday on Tuesday, just to let everybody know. Megan's having another birthday? Megan, could you slowly, for an old man's ears, repeat the name of the announcer that received the award? Sure, his name is Stuart Scott. Stuart Scott. Yes. Um, also, Robin... I need Ro that in order to Google him. Uh, Robin Roberts also has received the award, the Good Morning America announcer. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, anchor. Yes. And um, Jimmy Valvano, he also has a great speech about... He was fighting cancer also when he received the award, which was named after him. So. Thank you very much. We believe, so I pray. So you pray with me. Creator God, since we are in the midst of flag season in this country under your name, Memorial Day is already behind us. Today is D-Day, which marked the beginning of the Normandy invasion, which led to the, send the end of World War II. Flag Day, which marks the day an act of Congress adopted our flag in 1777, and a month from now, Independence Day, when we will once again celebrate the courageous declaration proclaimed by the Continental Congress. 
While many of our countrymen and women continue to amp up their divisive rhetoric, separating us into political parties, liberals and conservatives, citizens and would-be immigrants, and a host of races and colors, Father, I beseech you this day to initiate a healing of our divisions, leading us to rally around our flag so that we may return to a posture of patriotic Americans, which we all are. Without such reunification, I fear we will fall victim to another pandemic, one more deadly than the coronavirus we now fight. And while I'm on the subject of pandemic, Father, our hearts quicken as our country takes careful steps towards resuming living, studying, working, and playing together. Indeed, our joy over this is hard to contain, and we thank you for it. Please help us remain wise and considerate of others in our health practices and precautions as we approach herd immunity with our vaccinations. Please comfort everyone who is hurting today in any way at all. There are causes of our suffering, both large and small, that debilitate us and isolate us into feeling we are the only ones. Help us to know when to speak out about things which scripture declares are not right, and when to hold our tongues so we can listen and reflect as you would have us. And now we join our hearts with the first disciples, praying silently as I pray aloud the very familiar words Jesus gave us when he was teaching us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus says that whoever does the will of God is his family. Let us move into the new week serving others as Jesus did. And may the steadfast love of God give you hope, the redeeming power of Christ give you courage, and the abiding presence of the Spirit give you strength as you do your best to serve the will of God this day and every day now and forevermore. Amen.
justice and praise become 